So, Father, we just come to you now, Lord, and we thank you, God, that um, we fight the battle from our knees, Lord, and that our only surrender is to you alone. So, Father, right now I pray that we would just set everything else aside in this moment and be fully here, Lord, available to what you would have to say to each one of us, Lord. I thank you, God, that your word is the living word and that each of us will leave here with a personal message from you, God. Lord, some women need to hear about that belt of truth the most today. Others, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, that breastplate of righteousness, Lord. All of them important, Lord. Each of us will be met at the very point of our need, Lord, and we trust you for that today. Lord, be with me now as I speak on your behalf, Lord. Teach me, Lord, even while I'm speaking, Lord, and help us not to be only hearers of your word, Lord, but doers, Lord. Help us to leave here with a personal application, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to meet here today. In Jesus' name, amen. It is always great to be with you all. I love, love coming Wednesday mornings. Full disclosure, I said last night, I said, wouldn't we all love to start our day here? Um, and we're committed. We love coming Tuesday nights because it's when we can, but we get to start our day together. We get to start our day in God's word. And you think about even Jesus set that example of going out early in the morning and um, being with his father. And so thank you for being here this morning. Um, many of you know I work at a school. We're in the last nine weeks of school, and it's around this time of year that our seniors are deciding where they go to college. Does anyone in this room have a senior? Anyone? And do they know where they're going to school yet? Did they get a letter in the mail or did they get an email? An email. So if you're on social media, you might see kids holding up an iPad with where they were accepted or an iPhone. Um, when I was accepted to college, we got a letter in the mail and you were hoping for the thick envelope, right? Probably true for most of you. Um, so students are finding out where they're going. They've been preparing for that moment and they're excited. And um, at Westminster Academy, we have a few unique traditions. One of them is that when a student decides where they're going, they will go to the guidance office and they'll ring a bell and then they stick a pen in a map where they're gonna be um, in the United States. But that's not even my favorite one. My favorite is that in one of our Bible classrooms, they will um, dip their hand in paint and they put their handprint on the wall and the school colors or the logo of wherever they're going. And some will go on to be Seminole, like Pam, Others will go on to be Gators, like Linda. Um, some will go to Christian colleges. And then you have those that go to the Ivy Leagues. And with all those, God will use them. He'll use them at a Christian college. He'll use them at the schools in the Northeast that seem to have lost their minds. Um, he'll, use them. he'll use them in the party schools. God will uniquely place them if they see it as their mission field. Um, but I want to read you a mission statement from one of those colleges today. And I want you to see if you can... Um, guess which one it might be. So this is the mission statement of a college that falls into one of those categories. And it says, the founders said this, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. That's John 17, three. And therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Who thinks they know what school? I heard Harvard and that is the correct answer. That was Harvard's founding mission statement. That was in 1643. And as I don't know exactly when it changed, but I do know that in August of 2021, they elected their first new chief chaplain who was an atheist, Greg Epstein. And he had just authored a book called Good Without God. So we would say to that, what in the world happened? And I would say to you, the world happened. The world replaced the word of God as central. And sadly, it's done that in many of our, what our, we would consider or what the world would consider our top educational institutions. They've replaced the truth of God's word as central with the lies of the world. And that's where we're going to start today. When we think about putting our armor, we have to think about truth. And in your um, books, that first point on there is we need to know what we believe and we have to stick to it. We can't compromise. 
Last week, Rosemary had a hard lesson to teach. I'm glad she was out of town this week. I get to talk about the tools for battle. She had to talk about the difficult things that we don't like to think about, the, the unseen wars that we wage every day. And just one verse that really summarizes last week, verse 12, it said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We think about the things we get caught up in every day, and we might think that we're mad at a certain person or a certain organization or just a situation, and really the enemy is the one all behind that. I don't know how many of you all saw, saw the movie The War Room with Priscilla Shire, but um, if you didn't, the synopsis of the movie is that she and her husband, their, their marriage was on the cusp of ending, and a mentor came into her life who was a prayer warrior, and she literally had a war room, she called it, it was a closet, where that, she made that her place of prayer, and she said to um, the, the character that Priscilla played, she said, your husband is not your enemy, your enemy is the devil. And we have to know who our enemy is, otherwise we're fighting the wrong battle. And no matter what battle we fight, because we do fight battles here, we have to remember that the war has been won. The war was won on the cross through Jesus Christ. We're getting ready to celebrate that and Jesus' resurrection next month, but we should celebrate it every day. And we have to remember we're in the midst of the battle where it might feel like we're losing, but the true war has already been won through the finished work on the cross. You think back to World War II when they stormed the beaches of Normandy. The battle was won, but the Allies still had to go in. They still had to take the city of Berlin, and that's a picture of what we have to do. This battle that's raging in the heavenly realms, and we're, our society is so used to seeing, touching, feeling. We don't always see it, but it's there, and it's constant, and we have to be aware. And we know that Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, and he was there actually chained sometimes to the Roman guards. And they would be in their armor. And he most likely chose that as the metaphor for this passage because um, I love that the Bible, it, it tells stories. They're real stories, but it tells stories and it gives us metaphors of how we can take a really hard to understand concept and it puts skin on it. So he's sitting there, he's attached to these ro Roman guards literally at certain points. And he looks at the equipment and he says, how can I use this to teach the church of Ephesus about how to wage war against our enemy? So Paul is about to present the seven essentials for battle. And we look at that equipment. And again, I think each of us will leave here. I know which one I'll share with you in a minute. It probably meant the most to me, but I think there'll be one that stands out to each of us. But before we get into those specifics, another illustration, a modern day illustration. Um, I know we have football fans in the room and I think a lot of us know that Pam is one of them. And when she lived in Tallahassee, um, Coach V, who was the strength and conditioning coach um, under Bobby Bowden, was um, a part of her church. And when he would volunteer at Vacation Bible School, he would bring the equipment that the players would wear. And occasionally he might even bring a player or two, which the kids, of course, really loved. And he would show them the equipment. He would show them the helmet and the shoulder pads and all the different things that they would give their players. And he would say, we love our players so we want to protect them. And then he drew that parallel. God loves his children. God loves you, and he wants to protect you. But we have to be committed to putting that armor on, and not just once, daily. The players have to put that equipment on every game. We have to put on the armor of God every single day. And I love it that it's his armor. It says put on the full armor of God. It's his and not only did Paul use the illustration probably from the Roman guards, but I wonder if he looked back to Isaiah. If you want to look um, later, you can write it down on your notes. Isaiah 59, 16 through 17 um, is another place in the Old Testament that we see the armor of God, but it's actually Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus being our intercessor and interceding. And it says, he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene, so his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. What a picture that Isaiah even gave us back then. So that was Isaiah 59, 16, and 17, if you want to read that later. So we can all agree that life is a battleground, so we have to go into it prepared. 
Um, the team here is so encouraging, and Linda Fuller sent me a text yesterday that she was praying for me as I was preparing to teach, and she sent me an image, and it says, Satan has a plot, but God has a plan. Satan has a plot, but God has a plan. Thank you for that, Linda. That was a, a good reminder. And God's plan is for us to use the equipment that he has provided. So if you want to open your Bibles, if they're not already open to Ephesians 6, we're going to read Ephesians 6, verses 14 through 17. And it says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we can only stand against the wiles of the devil to the degree that we're protected with that whole armor of God. And many of you have shared um, in small groups that you already do that, that before your feet hit the floor in the morning, that you put on the armor of God. And I've been challenged to do that. I did it this morning. Um, how could I not with teaching this lesson? But I want to make that um, a daily habit, um, a part of spiritual growth to really realize the power of praying on the armor of God each day. So the first piece, A on your outline, is the belt of truth. And with each of these, we're going to look at how it was used then and how do we use it now. So how was it used? When a soldier tightened his belt, he was ready for combat. Remember the Roman soldiers wore... Um, they probably wouldn't like it called a skirt, we'll call it a tunic, um, but they had that tunic on, so in the process of tightening their belt, they would tuck that in so that it wouldn't impede their movements as they were going on to the battlefield. Sort of like we would say rolling up our sleeves, getting ready to work. They would tuck in that tunic into the belt, and it was a way that they got ready for battle. So that is how they used it. How do we use it? Paul says that truth performs this crucial function in the spiritual warfare, that truth prepares us for battle. We have to win the battle of the mind, and you do that by planting truth there. Truth buckles us up and keeps us ready so that we're not impeded in the battle. What truth is he referring to? A on your outline, what is truth? We know that truth is right here. It's in God's word. Truth is God's word. It doesn't change until God changes his mind on something, we as Christians should not either. This is our source. This is our manual, our strategy, our war plan. It's all right here, and he's given it to us in his word. Um, it should shape our worldview. Worldview is um, uh, something that so many churches are talking about right now because um, we've gotten away from some of the central truths of Scripture that all Christians should believe on. There's always been different denominations, and we can have our differences of preferences and opinion, but the central truths of scripture that Christians have believed for centuries must remain, must remain. It should, and it should empower and infect every decision that we make. We have to have a biblical worldview. And without cinching ourselves tightly with the belt of truth, all of our other weapons will fall off. Everything is connected to the belt. And that's B on your outline. The rest of the armor is attached to it. Um, my girls are growing up. For those of you that have been coming for a while, I used to show cute little pictures of them. Um, I'll show one today of one of them. But um, they're in fourth and sixth grade. And even in the last, I would say, five years, just the tools you have to have as a parent have changed so drastically. And conversations that you maybe used to have when your daughter turns 13, you have now when they're like eight. And how to do that without taking away their innocence and without telling them too much, um, I'm always looking for tools. So I want to give you one if you're a mom or a grandma. Um, it's called Mama Bear Apologetics, empowering your kids to challenge cultural lies. They've got to know what's coming at them. And if we don't tell them first, the world will. And this is a quote from that book. I love it. It actually has several different contributors. Um, and one of them said this. It says, truth is powerful and the most potent lies are wrapped in partial truth. If a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, then partial truths help the lies go down. And we can see that in our society, and that's why it's slipping into our churches. There's some partial truth in some of the lies that are being handed out, and that's why we have to know the word of God so thoroughly so that we don't get caught up in the, in the, the cultural trends of our society. So it's so important because the rest of the armor is attached to it. When we're filled with the word of God and living in it, we'll be ready for anything. 
So the belt of truth, that's our first weapon. The second one is the breastplate of righteousness. How was it used? Um, it covered the thorax, the, the vital organs of the body, your heart. None of us want to lose an arm and a leg. We like our appendages, but you can live without an arm or a leg. You cannot live without a heart. It's vital. Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. They had to protect the heart, and that was the breastplate of righteousness. That was its job. So number two, how do we use it? We use it to protect our heart. You think about your heart and your mind. We're going to talk about our mind in a minute, but our heart, it's the seat of our emotions, and everything we do flows from it. And it's not something that we can come up with on our own. We receive it. We receive Christ's righteousness. He imputes it to us through what he did, through the finished work of the cross. It's not about us trying harder. We receive it, and he places it on us. He's given it to us. So that's A on your outline. We are covered with the righteousness of Jesus. And we have to know that, that it's absolute that that comes from him. But B is that we do need to embrace right living. We need to embrace right living. If Christ died for us, and we know he did, why would we not live for him? You think about the Beatitudes. Um, one of them is, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I won't ask anyone to raise your hand, but when was the last time you really hungered, really thirsted for righteousness? When is that at the forefront of your mind? The second part of that Beatitude is that they will be satisfied. We're living in a culture that's so dissatisfied, always wanting the next thing, thinking that will satisfy them, and then it lasts for a few moments or maybe a few days or even a week, and then it's on to the next thing. It's a promise. When we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we'll be satisfied. Psalm 25, I think it's verse 3, says, um, no one whose hope is in the Lord will be put to shame. No one whose hope in the Lord will be disappointed. When we hope in the Lord, not in an outcome, we're never disappointed. So this verse is telling us when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, you can know that's a prayer request. He will answer 100% every time, and we will be satisfied. We must choose to put on the breastplate of righteousness that we receive from Christ. We're covered in his righteousness, but he's given us his Holy Spirit to enable us to live rightly in this world. There's a beautiful picture of this in the medieval times when a squire was about to be knighted, he would spend the whole night before in vigil and he would lay out the pieces of armor in front of him and he would kneel before them and, and spend that night in prayer. And what a picture of us offering ourselves to God, especially first thing in the morning, thinking of those pieces of the armor and praying and putting them on and picturing them handed to us by that nail scarred hand of our savior, the one who already won the war but he's preparing us for battle. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. See on your outline, we've got the belt of truth. We've got the breastplate of righteousness. The next one is the war boots of peace. Um, how many of you guys are shoe people? You like to go shoe shopping. We've got a few in here. Um, that's never been my thing. I'm too much, I love comfort. And so um, I try to have decent shoes, but I really love, really love my comfort. But um, back in the early 90s, as a young lady learning fashion trends, um, I struggled with shoes a little bit, especially one particular weekend. Um, all of us know when you go through a death, you're kind of a little bit, you know, just not all there. And it, my grandfather's funeral had been that weekend. And um, it was the following day we were at church, had relatives in town. And I remember exactly the outfit that I had on. And I must have been, um, again, I was early in my fashion days. I got to church and I had on a black velvet shoe and a brown, like, fake leather shoe. And I thought, what was I wearing that that was really the two choices? They were pretty stark difference. And so I got to church, and at that tender age of 12 or 13, I thought, oh, this is embarrassing. And so I think my mom took me over to, the, like, the clothing ministry bank, and, like, there's nothing there. And um, my friend Stephanie, many of you know Stephanie Leonard Chen, um, we had just become friends that year. And she looked at me, and she said, we're about the same size. I'll just give you one of my shoes and we'll just like both look weird. And so that was a milestone in our friendship. Find yourself a friend that will switch shoes with you so that um, they got to be your same shoe size and um, that will be weird with you. And so we were both um, a little odd that day. And um, I don't have a picture of that because that was before digital cameras, but I do have a picture of our little girls 
uh, 25 years later. This is Stephanie's youngest, Becca, on the left, and that's my little Macy on the right. And we went to the beach sometime during COVID. It's all a time warp, right? So sometime in the past two years. And um, we were going to go for a scooter ride, and my daughter had on flip-flops, which if, I know you maybe not have scootered lately, but you don't wear flip-flops. It's like a recipe for a stub toe. So little sweet Becca said, well, I'll give you one of my shoes, and I'll take one of your shoes so that we can both ride our scooters. And I thought, this is really happening. All these years later, they're still taking care of us, Macy. So we, we did get a picture of that moment, and it's such a picture of we need the right shoes. We need the right shoes. We've all been in that situation where maybe we had the cute shoes on, but at the end of the day, we were regretting that decision. We've got to be ready. Got to be able to endure. And the other, so that's the cute picture. Then we have these maybe not so cute sandals. Um, we call them the war boots of peace, but they're really more of a sandal. And these are what those Roman soldiers would wear. And they would lace up their shins. And they actually even had an open toe. But um, the thing I didn't know about these that I learned this week was that there was nails in the bottom and they weren't meant for running. So you know the song, these boots were made for walking? Well, these were not made for running. There was no option of retreat. If you look at all the different pieces of armor, there wasn't one for the back. There wasn't one for running away. These were not meant for running. These were like more like the cleat the football player would wear that would give them traction and would prevent sliding. Um, a cross-reference for that is Psalm 3731. Psalm 3731, it says, the law of his God is in his heart, his steps do not slip. Again, we go back to truth, being in your heart, you've got the belt of truth, and now you've got the war boots of peace, and they keep your feet from slipping. So that's how the soldiers would use them. They dug in and it gave them the advantage in battle. And since we're talking about peace, we have to remember that we're called to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. There's times where we have to wage war for what we believe in, and it's not about just keeping the peace. I don't like conflict. I'm sure there's many of you in here that don't either. I'm not a confrontational person, but there's those times where you have to make peace, and it comes at a cost, and you have to dig your heels in and stand firm. Um, so two, how do we use them? Again, that picture of being planted firmly on solid ground. A, on your outline, we need to be planted in peace. What does that mean? The peace we have with God, first of all, the peace with God. And we have that the moment that we become his daughter. We're all God's creation. Every person who's ever had a pulse is God's creation, but we are not his children until we receive the gift of salvation. But when you become his daughter, you are at peace with God eternally. You receive that breastplate of righteousness that he has covered you with, and you are positionally righteous because of him. But not only just peace with God, it's the peace of God. And we all know that that can come and go, not because God goes anywhere, but because sometimes we're not in his word. We're not grounding ourselves in truth. And the peace of God comes beyond your outline when we ask for it. We need to ask for peace. And there's a really clear description of that in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says this, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you guys know it, let your requests be made known to God. And after you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that. It's one of my absolute favorite scriptures. And it doesn't say that that peace comes from understanding. There are many things that will happen to us throughout our lives that we will not understand. And that's where faith comes in. And I'm sure God would allow us to ask him why when we get to heaven, but I don't think we're going to care then. Because it will all make sense and we'll be home. We have so many expectations that God did not promise. We love the um, promises of scripture that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And all of, he'll supply all of our needs and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Another promise is that all those who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. So sometimes we expect things from here that God has not promised. He's only promised to be with us in the battle. So that, that peace comes not from understanding, it surpasses understanding. And you're standing on those promises of God. Again, going back to that essential 
truth that's our foundation. The next weapon we have is D on your outline, the shield of faith, taking up the shield of faith. How was it used? It was pretty large. If you look at this picture over here, um, it was about four feet high and two and a half feet wide, almost like a door. And it was covered with wood, and that wood would be oiled so that it would extinguish the fiery darts from the enemy. And um, in some versions in your Bible, it might have said, above all, put on the shield of faith. That doesn't mean like it's the most important one. As I was reading one commentary, it explained it this way. It literally means over all. When the Roman soldiers would go into battle, their enemies would not only shoot the fiery arrows directly at them, they would shoot them up into the air, and then they would come down. And so the first row of soldiers would have that shield up in front of them. But the following rows would take that shield and they would put it over them. And it would form that protective wall so that they were safe on all sides. And when I read that, I couldn't help but think of the body of Christ, the church, and why God calls us to be part of a local church. And so many of us have seen the statistics probably over the past two years. There was a time when our churches were closed. I mean, historically, the first time in my lifetime, certainly, and for all of you. Um, and there's certain people that definitely still have reasons, maybe, but most of us, probably 95% of us, should be back in church. And yet we read so much research from Barna and others that many Christians have not returned to church. And that is the organization that God chose that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So I just wanna encourage you, um, if that's you, or if it's a close friend of yours, invite them to church this Sunday, because this is the kind of weapon that involves community. They needed each other to form that hedge of protection around them. So that's how they used it. How do we use it? Again, we're battling in warfare. We each have those fiery arrows that come at us each day. Um, I'll tell you one of mine this week. It was, I guess it was Monday night. Um, I could not sleep. I don't normally have a problem sleeping. I usually fall asleep like that. And I could not sleep. And I got three hours of sleep Monday night. I'm teaching yesterday. It's a long day. I get to work about 7.45, maybe 8, because I'm usually running late, and um, go from there to picking up my mom to coming here, and it's like a 14-hour day, and I had three hours of sleep. Wow. And um, many of you guys know Edith Harrison. She was here last night. Um, that morning, yeah, that was yesterday morning. It feels like a long time ago. <laughs> that morning, I was like, oh, I, sh I need to text Edith. And again, find yourself friends like Stephanie and Edith. Edith went through cancer, as many of you know, this past year. And all throughout that, I would try to get to her first, and she would always, almost always text me first, how are you? How can I pray for you? And she texted me yesterday morning, praying for you for tonight. And I said, well, I need it because I just slept three hours. And I was held up by those prayers, those texts from Linda, those texts from Pam. Like, God surrounds us in the midst of those fiery darts. And that's just one example. But as I was laying there, I had to realize that's what it was because the three melatonin weren't working. So you have to recognize, what is it? Those things that, again, that person that you think you're mad at, that's really the enemy. That situation, that's really the enemy. We have to recognize it and, again, replace the lies with the truth. So A, what are your flaming arrows? Arrows, I basically just said that. What are his schemes against you? Um, think about it. Recognize it. That's one of the first things. You have to know and recognize it so that you can combat it. And then find a scripture to hold on to that you can just recite, meditate, memorize, so that you have that truth to combat the lie. Um, secondly, B, we need to depend on the Lord. I love the optional part of the homework. Um, that's almost always my favorite part of the homework, so please don't make it optional. Do it. If you haven't done it this week, go back. It's a beautiful story of God defending his people in Second Chronicles. And they basically said, we can't do this. And God said, I know. The battle's not yours. And he literally confused the enemy and they killed each other. And God's people were victorious. And it ends with saying they had peace on every side. How many of us want to have peace on every side? What a beautiful sentence. We want peace on every side, so we need the covering of the Lord. We cannot withstand the darts, but the Lord can. Hebrews 4, 14 through 15 shows us the picture of Jesus as our high priest who can sympathize with us. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. How amazing is it to know that he knows what we go through? If you've been through a divorce and you have a friend that's gone through a divorce, walking, that person walking you through that journey, if you have a child that's been sick, to gain comfort from the comfort that person has received from the Lord, those are just a few examples. Jesus has been tempted in every way that we are, so he gets us. He knows us intimately. And how humbling of God that he would send his son to experience the temptations that we do on this earth so that he wouldn't be far off but he would be up close and able to identify with us. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So next on your outline, E, the helmet of salvation. Number one, how was it used? If you look here at this helmet, it wasn't just like a football helmet. It went down on their cheek. Um, it extended down the back to protect their neck. And it was virtually the only, the only weapon that was going to penetrate that was like the end of an ax, the hammerhead of an ax. And so they would have to be really up close, which often they were. But that helmet, that's how it was used for them when they were in battle. So how do we use it? It's a metaphor for our salvation. Not just the initial deliverance from sin, but the ongoing deliverance from sin's power. Um, we were talking in the small group um, leader meeting just how we have so much to learn about truly the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, when Jesus was on earth, he told his disciples, it's better for you that I go because I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. And if I was one of those disciples, I would have said, no, really, I I'd really prefer that you stay because I can touch you and I can talk to you. And God said, no, I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. And so that helper comes to us. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, verses 3 through 5. It says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And then it goes on to say to take every thought captive. Again, we go back to that first weapon, truth. It's a, the battle so often starts in our mind, so we've got to protect our mind. Um, notice that it says you have to take the helmet. There has to be initiative on our part. Christ can be handing it to us, but if we don't take that from him, it's not ours to take, and we're not protected for the day, we have to receive it. Um, lastly, we have only one offensive weapon, but we only need one. And I've held it up several times today. I'm going to hold it up again, the Bible, God's Word. And I want to hold up another um, Bible to you that I got at a conference, and it's the New Testament, and it's for unwritten languages. And this is it. Um, can you guys see in the back? This is the New Testament for unwritten languages. This was worth buying to me because I needed the reminder that there are people around the world still that don't have a precious copy of God's word in their own language. They don't have it. And yet many of us, who has like five or more Bibles at home? All different versions. And then we've got it on our phone. We've got it everywhere. And so many days we walk by this precious book. And it's not just a book. It's God's love letter to us. He has something to say to us every single day. And it would be like if you looked at a calendar um, many of us have those apps on our phone where you can look back and see how many steps you took in a day, and you can look back and see if you closed your rings. How many days would there be unopened gifts if you were to look back at a calendar, the days that you missed maybe what God had to say to you, but also how God might have used you in the life of someone else because you would have had an apt word to speak to them. The Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when we've got God's word in our heart, we're going to naturally share that with others. So the sword of the spirit, how was it used? Um, it was a short sword. This one looks a little longer, but it was a short sword, and it was the most effective for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Again, up close and personal. So how do we use it? Again, we have to take it. We have to take the sword, which is the word of God, and A, by using the word of God. We see even Jesus did this when he was tempted in the wilderness. If Jesus needed to memorize scripture, how much more do we? Every time the enemy came at him with a, a lie, he had a memory verse to come back at it with. B, by knowing the mind of God. God's word reveals God's mind. Again, it's not just any book. And if you're having a problem trusting God, you can't trust someone you don't know. And you come to know him by reading his word. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
So if you're having a faith issue, you, you know, trust issue, it's because of lack of relationship. Get close to him again. He hasn't wandered. It's usually us that wanders. It says, draw near to him, and he'll draw near to you. See, by knowing the technique for taking up the sword. First, just reading it. Reading it. And there's not always going to be this big revelation. We've heard Rosemary say many times that Bob and Rosemary were committed to um, doing devotions in the morning with their kids. And they would read it every morning. And Bob would like to say that every time for over you know, 20 years, no one had a thought or a question. They were half asleep, but they did it. And then now you look at Roby and Tori and how they're making a difference for the kingdom of God. They heard it. It was planted. And so be faithful in reading. You're not always, there are those days where you get to sit with your candle and your worship music and you get to dive deep and you leave with this revelation from the Holy Spirit. And those are wonderful days. But there's also days where you read it and it might be Leviticus that day. Let's just be honest. <laughs> but it's there for a reason. We were, we were reading as a family one night and it was the genealogies and my daughter was like, can we just skip this? And I was like, I know, honey, I know. But do you know the only thing we know about these people is who they begat, who they had. A lot of it lists the women, which isn't fair because they're the ones that gave birth, but that's for another day. But it lists these men, and it doesn't say how much money they had or where they lived or what they accomplished. It says who they fathered. And I think that even in the genealogies, we can get a message from the Lord that what are our priorities? What will we really be remembered for? So reading God's word, um, and we really are without excuse. Um, I'm going to give you two examples. One from um, Dr. Allen, um, or Harry Allen Ironside. He had little formal education, um, but he was powerful for the Lord. He read through the Bible 14 times by the time he was 14 years old. And you might say, well, he might have just loved to read. Well, he dropped out of school at eighth grade. So I'm thinking he probably wasn't the best student. He went on to say he did later regret that, but God used him. He became the pastor of Moody Church in Chicago from 1929 to 1948. He authored more than 40 wide-selling books and commentaries, and Wheaton decided to give him an honorary degree. Um, God used him in a mighty, mighty powerful way. It's not human wisdom. It's the, it's the wisdom of God. And you might say, well, he was a pastor. Pastors have all day to read the Bible. He wasn't when he was 14. Um, but I'm going to give you another example of someone very busy who chose to make it a priority. And I'm going to read it straight from this because I don't want to miss a word. Lieutenant General William K. Harrison, he was the most decorated soldier in the 30th Infantry Division, rated by General Eisenhower as the number one infantry during World War II. General Harrison was the first American to enter Belgium, which he did at the head of the Allied forces. He received every decoration for valor except the Congressional Medal of Honor. He received the Distinguished Silver Cross, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, the Purple Heart. He was one of the few generals to actually be wounded in action. When the Korean War began, he served as the Chief of Staff in the United Nations Command, and because of his character and self-control, was ultimately President Eisenhower's choice uh, to head the long and tedious negotiations to end the war. So pretty busy guy, could we all agree? Um, General Harrison was a soldier's soldier. When he was a 20-year-old cadet, he began reading the Old Testament once a year and the New Testament four times a year. General Harrison did this until the end of his life. Since it only takes 80 hours to read the entire Bible, which I don't have a confession to make, I, had, I really didn't watch much TV before COVID. And I, under, I came to understand during COVID the Netflix, Netflix binge, where you can sit and waste hours of your life catching up on a show that lasted 10 years in like two weeks. And I really did start to feel convicted about it. And I thought, I am spending like hours of my life. And it's fine to be entertained if it's wholesome entertainment, but hours. I, I didn't spend that much time in God's word, and God really convicted me. It only takes 80 hours to read the entire Bible. Well, calculate your favorite show and what you have been to watch, because it's probably been most of us, and think about that. Let the Holy Spirit let that sink in. General Harrison began um, obligated just a half hour of reading God's word each day. Do any of us have a half hour to cultivate the mind of Christ like General Harrison? How about 14 minutes to read God's word? in a year. How about three minutes a day to read the New Testament in a year? Three minutes a day to 
be able to read the New Testament in a year. Even in the thick of war, he maintained his commitment by catching up during the two and three day respites for replacement and refitting which followed battles so that when the war ended, he was right on schedule. When at the age of 90, his failing eyesight no longer permitted this discipline, he had read the Old Testament 70 times and the New Testament 280 times. No wonder his godliness and wisdom were proverbial, and the Lord used him for 18 fruitful years to lead Officers Christian Fellowship. General Harrison's story tells us two things. It is possible for the busy of us to systematically feed on God's word. No one could be busier or lead a more demanding life than this general. His life remains a demonstration of a mind programmed with God's word. His closest associates say that every area of his life, domestic, spiritual, professional, and each of the great problems he faced was informed by the scriptures. People marveled at his knowledge of the Bible and the ability to bring its light to every area of life. He saturated himself in the word of God literally before literal battle. How much more do we? So the first way to do that is by reading it, but the next step of that is meditating on it. My mom was here last night, and um, my mom um, has been such an example to me of reading the Bible and treasuring it. She taught um, for over 30 years in Christian schools and um, loved teaching the Bible. And she is getting on an age, and her eyes are beginning to really bother her. And she's um, got macular degeneration, and so about once a month, I drive her to the doctor to get a shot in her eye. And no matter how many times she does it, that's unnerving. It's never going to feel good, and you know you're going to be miserable for a couple days. And every time I pick her up, she's got this little um, stack of cards with her. And I had to beg to keep them just to share with you guys today because I wanted you to have the visual. And she takes these, and she will literally, like, read them out loud in the car. And we don't get to see each other as much as I'd like, so sometimes I just want to talk to her. And she's reading these out loud in the car. And here's just one of them. It's Matthew 6:34. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up with when the time comes. And she's got a whole thing of them here, laminated. And um, a friend of hers is going through a really difficult time with her husband's health. And we went to visit her um, about a week ago and she just kept saying, we can take flowers, but I wanna give her something else. She goes, I'm gonna give her my my ring of, of Bible verses. And when she handed them, um, her friend said, oh, I can't take these. These are yours. She goes, I want you to have the ones that I've used. There was something personal about that. These, she had waged war with those cards. So these are actually a new set of cards that she's making new memories with. But last night when she was here um, and I was sharing this, she actually started to spout off one from memory. And it was, even to old age, I will sustain you. I will carry you. And that is the next point on here is memorizing it. If you meditate on it, you, you probably won't even have to really t- deliberately try to memorize because when you meditate on something over and over again, it comes in your heart. So she's got these cards, but they're also in her heart. So whatever that looks like for you, I have a friend that um, she uh, had four kids and then had a special needs child who required constant care. So she was not in that time with the candle and the worship music and sitting in the Bible for an hour, but she made three by five cards. She had them by her kitchen sink. She had them by his changing table. She had them in her bathroom mirror for the days she had time to put on makeup. And she soaked herself in God's words and his promises. You can do it. You have to figure out what works for you. So reading it, meditating on it, memorizing it. Um, and then the, the last one is studying it, really studying it. There's those times of devotions. For many of us, devotions in the morning, most of us, I guess if we were really dedicated, we could get up several hours early, but for most of us, we read a devotion in the morning. But there's that time where you really just need to dive in deeper. And there's a quote, I wish I know who said it, but it says, the Bible is such that a child can drink from it without drowning, but a scholar can dive in deep and never touch the bottom. I'll say that one more time. The Bible is such that a child can drink without drowning, And a scholar can dive in deep and never touch the bottom. We can always be learning from the living word of God. So study it, meditate on it, memorize it. Um, That's really the pattern. If you think about this Bible study, um, you have your one-on-one time with God during the week. And then you come and discuss it with the ladies at your table. And you see how God taught each of you personally. We ask each other questions. And then Rosemary teaches on it. There's that pattern of digesting it and discussing it and consuming it and letting it become part of you. 
So to summarize the treasures we possess, we all agree we're in a battle. It's heating up, wouldn't you say? Yes. You think about every day. Um, but God in his great love, just like that coach loved his football players and gave them protective equipment, God loves us, his daughters, and he has given us protective equipment that we have to take up and use to defend ourselves and put it on every single day. Kent Hughes said this, this quote is in your book, it is in communion with Christ that the armor is set and reset for battle. We must allow him to cinch the belt tight, to lower over us the breastplate of righteousness, and thus armed we may ask that his truth and righteousness permeate our speech and our life. Again, the more time we spend in God's word, the more that will come out of us. That will be our first response instead of our own emotions and feelings. I want to close with a story. Um, I know we all try to moderate how much of it we watch, but most of us are watching the horrifying images that we see on the news right now of literal war. Literal war. Um, perhaps the, the most awful story I'd heard of was the maternity hospital that was bombed. And to God be the glory, last night there was an Asbury alum that gave birth in a hospital to the sound of bombs going off to a healthy baby girl. And so we've been praying for her. I don't know her personally, but through an alumni connection at Asbury, they've been asking for prayers. So you can pray for Sasha and her husband, Nikita, and their new baby girl. I don't know the name yet, but um, God allowed her to give birth to that baby. But can you imagine the, the mix of emotions? Um, so one of the things that's helped me is to know specific people to pray for. Well, I only knew about her about a week ago, but about four weeks ago, when things were heating up but hadn't happened yet, I was listening to a message um, from a Bible teacher out of uh, Tennessee, and it was a YouTube message, and I'm listening to it, and she gave an illustration. And as God would have it, it was an illustration about a family in the Ukraine. And basically, this missionary and his wife, they had three children, and the wife was re getting ready to go to the grocery store, and she let her two-and-a-half-year-old dress herself. Well, if you've had children, you know how that can go. And this little two and a half year old came out with a winter coat and shorts and a ski cap and rain boots and sunglasses. And she looked adorable. Um, but her husband said this, he said, she unknowingly represented exactly what daily life has become in the Ukraine. Since we don't know what to expect in the country, we mentally prepare for all options. This mental calibration of expectations across a wide spectrum is exhausting. The daily routine of rain boots and sunglasses forces a few basic questions. Will there be sunshine or rain? Which means, will there be bloodshed or peace? Will the country disintegrate or rise up to defend herself? With every dawn, we prepare to put on our expectations for all scenarios. This daily exercise is truly a blessing for the believer that even in the uncertainty of a day filled with the horrors of a fallen world, that you can move from the midst of fear of the what if to faith in who God is. These are his words. So in the end, we still face the unknown of every day, but now we more eagerly slide on the sunglasses and the rain boots in faith, knowing that our Father is good. The Lord may not change blank, whatever that is for you, but the Lord strengthened me, being strong in the Lord. What I didn't know as I was listening to this is that this message was seven years old. I looked and it had 110,000 views and it said 2014. So I immediately was like, what was going on in Ukraine in 2014? And it was when the whole everything happened with um, Crimea. And so this wasn't even recent. And these missionaries had stayed there faithfully. And they're there now. So then I did more Googling, and I went to their website, which hasn't been updated since then, but um, this was his request. At 4 a.m. local time, Ukraine woke up to the sound of bombing, and invasion into the country has begun. Our prayer request, pray for Ukraine to trust what is not changeable and to hope in what cannot be lost. May the church in Ukraine be strengthened through this war. That was his prayer. We started off this passage with be strong in the Lord, plant your feet, be buckled in truth, put on your armor. And just as that little girl prepared for every scenario of weather with that outfit that she put together, God has prepared us for every scenario through that armor of God. So I cannot think of a better way to close this time today than to pray for this missionary couple, but to also pray that just like that little girl, 
that we would be dressed for the battle that we each face every day. Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you now, Lord, and God, I, I just first pray, Lord, for Doug and Masha Shepherd, Lord, and for their three children, Lord. Um, I don't know where they are right now, but you do. And Lord, we pray for Sasha and Nikita and their baby girl. Lord, these are brothers and sisters in Christ that are living in the midst of a war zone. And we pray for them. And Lord, we so, we're so tempted to say all we can do is pray, but that is the best thing we can do. We fight the battle on our knees. But Lord, in this very room right now, there are women fighting battles, Lord, fighting battles of the mind with mental health, Lord, fighting battles in marriage and their workplace, Lord, health issues, recent losses, Lord, financial struggles, Lord, whatever the battle is that each one of us faces today, Lord, whatever fiery arrow would come against us, Lord, you can snuff it out. Lord, help us to trust you, help us to lean into you, to rely on you, to know the battle is not ours, but yours, and that you want to give us peace on every single side. So Lord, may we take up the armor today, Lord, as we go from this place, and Lord, may the overflow of our life be your truth to a world that so desperately needs it, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for this time together, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much.